Here to discuss both issues is Republican Congressman Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin. He's also the chair of the Select Committee on China. Welcome back to the News Hour. Great to be with you. I first want to ask you about this funding bill. You voted for the short-term government funding bill back in September, but voted against the one yesterday. Why? It's hard to see how anything changes with another short-term funding bill. Prior to the other one, I'd never voted for a clean CR. And now here we did waste a month deposing Speaker McCarthy, having this internal battle, and yet we're exactly where we were at the start of that process. And I'm increasingly concerned that we are going to sleepwalk our way into a defense sequester. Because, of course, according to the terms of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, if we don't pass appropriations bills, we're going to trigger a 1 percent across the board cut next year. And at a time of growing geopolitical crisis in Europe, in the Middle East, and of course the Indo-Pacific, a defense sequester would be about the stupidest thing we could do. So that is my concern. Speaker Mike Johnson was forced to rely on Democratic votes to get this bill through the House using the same maneuver that Kevin McCarthy used before that group of House Republicans decided to uh, topple him. Will M Johnson meet the same fate or will Republicans give him more room to maneuver? I think he'll have more room to maneuver. He sort of has a honeymoon period. But to the point of your question, it is fitting that the CR ends on Groundhog Day because it is Groundhog Day in the House of Representatives. The only path forward as I see it is we should pass a clean, non-offset Israel bill. Therefore, we can start a process of one track of negotiations over Israel, Taiwan, and defense appropriations, a separate track pairing Ukraine and border, and force both parties to compromise on that issue. It's going to require compromise. And then the Speaker should commit to a series of robust reforms to the entire budgeting process, which is broken and which is why we are in this situation. And until you fix that, we're going to wind up with an endless series of repeating CRs. And oh, by the way, we should pass the bipartisan, bicameral ending government shutdown act so we don't do this shutdown politics and constantly live under the threat of a shutdown. Republicans right now are increasingly positioning aid for Israel and Ukraine as an either or proposition. Why is that? Well, I don't think it is an either or uh, proposition. I think we are the world's sole superpower and we can afford and, and must do both. I think what Ukraine has revealed since deterrence collapsed in Ukraine is that our entire munitions industrial base is insufficient. So we have here an opportunity to make a once in a lifetime, a generational investment in our munitions industrial base and build weapon systems, long range precision fires that are not only critical for Ukraine, for Israel, but are critical for our most important national security challenge, which is China's threat to Taiwan. That's what we have to do. That's why it's not an either or. And certainly the enemies we have arrayed against us, this sort of anti-American alliance led by China, are increasingly working together. It's China, Russia, and Iran dedicating themselves to undermining American leadership. So for us to sort of segment these problems, I think misses the global picture. Is that an argument that could hold sway among the Republicans who are increasingly skeptical of providing funding to Ukraine? Well, I think if we required, as part of the Ukraine funding, a couple of things. One, the administration to come to us with a plan or a classified expression of what the end state is in Ukraine, combined with two robust inspector general oversight provisions, I think that would go a long way towards alleviating those concerns. But again, the reason I advocate for pairing targeted clinical lethal Ukraine funding to border policy changes is that that requires both parties to compromise and those Democrats who may be skeptical of any tougher border policy in order to support further funding for Ukraine would have to come to the table. And that strikes me as a sensible thing to do, particularly as we have divided government. As we mentioned, you lead the Select Committee on China. The White House says President Biden wants to leave his meeting with China's Xi Jinping today with the U.S. relationship with China on firmer footing. In your view, how should the administration navigate this relationship with a focus on problem solving over provocation? I think the important thing to do is not to slow defensive action just to sit down at the table with Xi Jinping or other high level CCP officials because time and again we pay a price just to get to the table. The CCP makes a promise at the table and then it reneges on that promise later. Put differently, we pay up front in cash, but for the Chinese Communist Party, the check is always in the mail. And this meeting itself has come at a cost. We haven't sanctioned a single PRC official 
over the last two years for human rights abuses in Xinjiang, for its takeover of Hong Kong. We obviously haven't had a meaningful investigation into the origins of COVID. The spy balloon incident was downplayed. So there has been a revival of diplomatic and economic engagement with China that has come at a cost. And in response, China has actually grown more aggressive. Uh, you see right now an unprecedented tempo of pressure being applied from the mainland against Taiwan. And so I hope, if nothing else, President Biden will communicate in strong and clear and no uncertain terms that this threat to Taiwan needs to cease. A question about that. I mean, how should the U.S. approach countering China's influence, treating China like a geopolitical foe on the one hand, while working with China to solve major challenges like climate change, like the problems posed by artificial intelligence trying to stem the flow of illicit fentanyl into the U.S. The most important form of communication to the Chinese Communist Party, far more important than anything Biden says uh, in San Francisco right now, is actually that we surge hard power west of the international dateline to the Indo-Pacific to make it impossible for Xi Jinping to conquer Taiwan militarily. That is the language, the language of hard power that dictators like Xi Jinping understand. We also need to make sure that we don't mirror image our own Western values onto this regime. And in the past, people who have made an argument for cooperation with China have cited not only climate change, but also stability on the Korean Peninsula, as well as public health and pandemic prevention as areas where interests align. But the pandemic, the increased threats from the North Korean regime, uh, and certainly the fact that China is the worst environmental actor in the world, I think undermine this argument that somehow our interests align or that Xi Jinping cares about commitments made at COP27. I, I can assure you he does not. Republican Congressman Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin, thanks for your time this evening. We appreciate your insights. Thank you, sir.